Well, we are in Romans chapter 1 this evening. Romans chapter number 1, and we are in the middle of a study here uh, called Avoiding Confusion. And uh, in this study, we are looking at how to interpret uh, cultural events through a biblical lens. How do we as Christians, I mean, we see what's going on in the culture around us. The craziness, the, the way they've just changed truth, or really they have taken the label of truth and have completely disintegrated it till it actually means nothing anymore. So how do I as a Christian then stand up and what, which, what, I, what ought I to stand on, really? When the whole world around me says, no, you're wrong. When the whole world around me says, Jesus is a myth. When the whole world around me says, there's really no God. The whole world around me says, creationism is a fairy tale. The whole world around me says that there's no such thing as, as you know, two genders, that that's not real, that it's a spectrum. When the whole world around me says, you, know, you can love who you want to love and marry who you want to marry, and there's nothing wrong with that, and there's no you know, repercussions to that, that there's no right or wrong, good or evil, that there's no eternity, that there's no purpose in life. When the whole world around me is trying to deteriorate my foundation as a Christian, how ought I to view that? And so we're looking into Scripture here in these, uh, these services for the purpose of strengthening your foundation. And so we began a couple weeks ago with the very first part of looking at the cornerstone. The cornerstone. Who is the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. What's the purpose of a cornerstone? It's a foundation. It tells us exactly where the corner of the building is going to be. It tells us where the face is going to be, where the side is going to be. It tells us what the level is going to be. And so we build off of that cornerstone. If the cornerstone's crooked, then the whole building is going to end up being crooked. So Jesus is our cornerstone, and that means that's where we start as Christians to build our lives. And as we build our individual lives based upon the Word of God and upon Jesus Christ, we build our relationships there as well. All of our relationships, which of course bleeds over into our relationship, you know, dating and courting or um, engagement, marriage, family, you know, all of those things are based upon that cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Not only that, our morals, our belief system, our work ethic, everything. As a Christian, we base it off of that one cornerstone. And so we started there by talking about the cornerstone. Here in this section, we've been looking specifically at the existence of God. You say, preacher, I can't wait for you to get to the actual main issues here. And we are going to get to those. But we first had to build a foundation. Is Jesus Christ the cornerstone of your life? We worked on that. Now we say, does God exist? If, there is, if you believe that God exists, then it is going to dramatically change how you behave. I don't just mean verbally say that God exists, but then in your heart, not truly believe it or act upon it. I'm saying if you truly believe that God exists, it's going to change much about the way you behave. You can't help but see a difference in our culture today. From 50 years ago, when, I mean, I wasn't even around then, but 50 years ago, culture was extremely different. And the things the kids ran around doing and playing, the words that they used, what they allowed to be on television... Um, you know, there was a massive difference in our culture back then. One thing that has occurred during those 50 years is a decline of uh, Christian believers. Many have died, have gone on to their graves, have gone on to eternities, and it, it had not been passed on to their children. And their children did not pick up the torch, and they did not choose to believe in Christ. They fell away, and their children haven't even heard of the name of Jesus Christ. Don't know anything about it apart from jokes, apart from curse words, or apart from what Hollywood has said concerning priests or concerning uh, the fake religions. Does God exist? And we began by looking last week, talking about this. We uh, looked at the coexist bumper sticker and I went through each of the letters and what they stood for. And today I want to get into this. The inner revelation. This, and I'll quickly go through this, we saw coexist and what each of those meant, and really it is God exists. Um, we continue on, uh, the human, humanist manifesto, good without God. 
One third of those 35 and younger report no religious affiliation at all. 33%, the big number. But then uh, we looked at the decline of Christianity, but the rise, that red line, an increase, 21% increase of atheist, agnostic, or no faith whatsoever. One in four unchurched adults are skeptics. It's 25%, either atheist or agnostic. Now, we get to this idea, number one on your outlines. By the way, does anybody need an outline? One here is on the inside. God, who is full of love for His compassion, for His creation, passionate to have fellowship with us, He put inside of each one of His persons the gift of revelation. He put inside each of us a, a special gift. And I'm not talking about this inner light you know, that the New Agers might talk about. I'm talking about He has put inside each of us a knowledge. A knowledge that there is, must be, a higher being than us as humans. There must be a Creator. Even if they do not know His name, we know, they know, when we're born, we, we have this natural tendency inside of us to know there must be a God. The first thing I'm going to look at here is innate truth. Innate truth. Letter A. So there is a knowledge that God is a part of our very nature. It's something that we just automatically know. Something that is evident to us without even being told. Romans 1.19. You've turned to Romans 1. This is where we are going to begin reading now. We started in verse 18 last week that said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. What does he mean? In verse 18, he talks about the wrath of God. God's wrath being revealed from heaven against unrighteousness, against wickedness. Why could God be vengeful? Not vengeful, but why could God be upset and angry towards us for our evil and our wickedness if we've not seen Him, if we've not heard His voice audibly speaking to us, if we've not met Him on the campaign trail or seen videos of Him? or even have a, a drawing or a painting of Him. How can God expect us or hold us accountable for our actions? He answers that question in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest or showed or revealed in them. God has already placed within us God. He built that into us. Now, whether or not we choose to worship Him, that's another thing. This means that to deny the existence of God is a deliberate decision. Some people, they don't like being defined as an atheist. I've been hearing more of this recently. Folks who say, no, I don't want to call myself an atheist because that means that I have to be defined by God, whether I'm with Him or against Him. That, that means that I'm acknowledging that He's there and I'm choosing to reject Him. And they say, no, I don't like that idea at all. I am, not, I am not a theist or atheist. I have nothing to do with God because there is no God. So therefore, why should I put theist in the word at all? And they don't want to be defined as atheist anymore because they don't want to be defined in relation to God anymore. But to reject God is a conscious decision because we already have that knowledge in us. It's like gravity. We already understand from the time we're a little baby that to trip means to fall. Go fall down, go boom, get boo-boo. You know, and then mommy kisses it and blows on it and then puts a Band-Aid on it. And we already get a pretty good understanding of oh, what gravity is. I still do that thing with Camden where I stand him up on the edge of his crib and then I back up and I'm like, all right, jump. And uh, hey, every night, every single night, uh, he, he jumps and I catch him and then, then I turn him around and I say, okay, now fall backwards and I'll take a couple steps back and I'll count one, two, three, fall backwards. And I'll tell you what, that takes an awful lot of faith. <laughs> and there were certainly times where he struggled with that, where he's like, no, no, uh -huh, uh -huh. but lately he's been really good about it. He's just like, all right, count one, two, three. And then he falls over backwards and I catch him and we laugh about it and then say good night and he goes to bed. 
and he understands gravity. Now, there was a time there where he was getting a little scared to do it. At first, he didn't care uh, because he probably didn't have that great of a grasp on what, me, what it means to fall down and go boom. Well, he's fallen out of his crib several times since then, and you know, he has a good understanding now that it hurts, and now he knows what happens if daddy misses. <laughs> then uh, it, it has some consequences. But now he's back to trusting me again. So, you know, we just kind of go back and forth on that one and whether he trusts me or not. I haven't dropped him yet, yet, but uh, he, he still trusts me. But in order to ignore gravity, it means you have to make a conscious decision to choose to believe that something that obviously exists does not exist. This is what atheism is. You didn't grow up as an atheist, even if mom and dad had a, a transformative power, you know, in your growing up years, it still had to be trained out of you because it's natural to understand and believe that there is a God. Whether the choice was intellectual, meaning they, they had unanswered questions about God and concluded, if I can't answer these questions in a concrete way, then God must not exist. Anybody that that maybe have ever applied to you in your past? I had unanswered questions about God, and if I couldn't get a concrete answer about Him, then I'm just going to have to accept or choose to believe that He does not exist. Or maybe it's emotional. Sometimes you go through a personal tragedy, and it causes anger and bitterness at God. How could a good God allow this to happen? There must be no God if He allows these you know, innocents to suffer. Let me ask you this. Were there times where you knew God was real, but you kept pushing that knowledge out of your mind? You proclaimed yourself as an atheist, or you did not choose to believe in God. There were times where it crept in there, and you're like, but I mean, I know, I know, obviously, look around me, and this couldn't have occurred by accident. But then you push those thoughts out of your mind. No, I'm not, I'm not ready, I'm not willing to swallow that yet. Has that ever happened to you? Was that you? You see, we have an, an innate um, truth. Truth in and of itself is a debated topic these days. Is there such thing as truth? Is there anything concrete these days? Of course, according to our society, there is absolutely nothing concrete these days except what society is pushing at that particular moment. That's concrete and everything else uh, is bendable. But we also have letter B, a unique intellect. There's that innate, innate truth inside of us automatically, but letter B, there is a unique intellect. God has given mankind a unique intellect. As much as we may talk about chimpanzees and, wow, how smart they are, and, wow, this chimpanzee can, you know, do sign language. This chimpanzee can, you know, get the lid off a jar or an octopus, you know. Like, wow, look at this octopus. It's unscrewed the lid off of a jar. How amazing this is. If my two-year-old couldn't do that, we would say that he was mentally deficient. So we can talk about how smart chimpanzees are, but they pale in comparison to humans. We have been given a unique intelligence. This is the mechanism through which we make choices. You see, you, you have the ability to reason. The fish do not. You have the ability to think, to decide things for yourselves. All of that is because you have what is called volition. If you look up volition in the dictionary, it, the definition is the faculty or power of using one's will, a decision after deliberation. This is not something the hyenas get together and do. They don't gather themselves together in the African savanna and have a deliberation. And they consider whether or not they ought to go that way or that way or that way. They don't sit there and talk about it and, get, and, and weigh out the pros and cons and whip out some paper and pens uh, and, and then sign a contract based upon what it is they're going to do. It doesn't usually work that way. It doesn't work that way in nature. Some people think that we need to let nature dictate how it is that we behave. Say, well, follow after nature. Look what nature does. Well, that's a two-edged sword in a whole lot of ways. I mean, if you think about it, male lions in nature take the woman by force. And if she already has kids that aren't his, he eats those kids. 
and then he takes her by force so that she now has his kids. I mean, should we really follow nature? I could come up with a whole lot of other examples of why we should not uh, follow nature in every little thing that we do. But we have been given a, a unique intellect. This is what, part of what uh, it means to be made in the image of God. The apes, they were not made in the image of God. No other animal on the earth has been made in the image of God. It says in Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us, plural, the Trinity, make God in our, plural, image, after our, plural, likeness, and let them, man, have dominion over the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. From the very beginning, man began with the ability to organize, to lead, to uh, decide, and have that ability to reason and to think and then to act upon one's own volition. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had been given all of the facts and then were given a choice to eat or not to eat. And they, of their own will, of their own volition, made that choice. Evolution, and I don't, I don't like sticking the term science with evolution because evolutionary science is a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, because science means it is something that we can observe and test and experiment on. We can reproduce it by experimenting it. You can't do that with evolution. It's literally impossible. It is something that has never been seen. It is something that can never be observed. And it is something that can never be experimented upon. Therefore, it's not actually science by definition. But it is a theory. And then they go and they take experiments and science and then try to back it up. But evolution in of itself is merely a guess. But from the beginning, Scripture says we were given that intellect. It did not occur over time. As we were once monkeys walking around upright, hitting things with rocks, and eventually we discovered fire and hooted and hollered and whatnot, and eventually we learned how to make loincloths, and you know, that's, what, that's what evolution teaches us. The Bible teaches the opposite of that, that when God created us, He made us as we are. In fact, really, He made us better because our DNA has been degrading over the millennia as time went by. In Genesis 2.19, it says this, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what He would call them. And whatsoever, whatsoever Adam called every living creature... That was the name thereof. Adam was given the job of naming the animals, the creatures that God had made. Some take exception to that. And they say, what kind of ridiculous is that? I mean, think about the millions of species. They all had to cross over in front of Adam. I mean, how would, they, how would, God, how would any man have lined up the millions of species? You know, really, it's, it's hundreds of millions, if not billions of species now. Uh, that are all around the planet, how would they have all known to line up and cross right in front of Adam? So, and this man, how would he have had the time ever to sit there and name them all and to remember their names? You know, they say this is utterly ridiculous. Well, there didn't need to be hundreds of millions or even billions of species back then. Species, as they go through time, they uh, have a tendency to what we call microevolution. You know, uh, what were once the parent dogs, now some of them have shorter legs, some have longer legs, some have tails, some have no tails, some have long snouts, some have short snouts, some there have wide chests, and some like the German shepherds and the uh, you know, huskies have a real narrow chest like the wolf. And as time, there were big, big ones, there were small ones, and it, there was a whole lot of variety within that species. They didn't all, you know, that the chihuahua did not exist, you know, for Adam. Uh, the chihuahua is is kind of man's take on, we want a toy little dog to, you know, play with us uh, with short hair so it can do well in Mexico, you know. Uh, that's, that's kind of what man put different dogs together to make a tiny little dog. They didn't need to be, you know, uh, billions of species back then for Adam to name them. But this is more than a mere intelligence, though. As I said, 
you can train a rat to go through a maze and find his cheese. You can train an octopus to open a glass jar so that he can get the treat you know, out, out, out of the inside of the jar. You can train a monkey to use sign language to be able to get what it is they want. Yes, you can train them to do those things, but it's more than just intelligence. He has given us a unique intelligence that has morality attached to it. A knowledge of right and wrong. Do you think the lions have a knowledge of right and wrong when it comes to taking by force a mate or killing her children? This is just what comes natural to them. It is, part, it is instinctual to them. The, the male wants to procreate. He wants to keep the lion alive, even if he doesn't realize that's what he's doing. He, that's his natural internal uh, you know, drive. Those children are a hindrance to him being able to promote his line. And so he kills them, takes the woman, and you know, they don't know any different. That's simply how they behave. There's morality attached to us, though. You don't find animals quibbling over the morality of whether or not to say these words or to do those things or to go those places. Let's talk about our moral intellect for a little bit. He gave us a moral sense that you and I can reason things out and make value judgments about right and wrong is the imprint of God's image upon us. When we're made in the image of God, it doesn't mean that you look like God. Remember that God the Father is a spirit. I don't know what the physical manifestation of God looks like. We've only seen a few glimpses in Scripture of that, uh, where one glimpsed just the, the, the tail you know, of God, basically, as He passed by, and it practically blinded Him. Uh, of Isaiah, as He stands in the throne room of heaven, and He sees the majesty of God there in His throne room, and His train filled the temple, and what does God look like? Well, we, don't, we aren't given a description of what God must look like other than that we, we know that God the Father is a spirit. In other words, not a, a corporeal being like us. Now, He has imprinted Himself upon us. And morality is one of those things that we get because we were made in the image of God. This intellect is also the means by which God has enabled us to believe and accept or to reject. You see, your little kitty cat at home, as cute as it may be when it's purring or playing with its feather or the laser light on the ground, it cannot choose to believe in God. It cannot choose to reject God. It is literally incapable of handling that information and making a decision because God did not give it the apparatus, the, the spiritual apparatus, let alone the mental apparatus, to absorb that information. You see, we alone have been given morality, which means we alone, humanity, has been given the discernment or the ability to discern between good and evil. Look at verse number 21 here in Romans 1. It says, well, in verse number 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, you look around at what has been made on this planet, and then you can clearly see the invisible things of God. Does God exist? Well, I can't see the wind, but I can certainly see what it does. I may not be able to see God, but I can certainly see ir irrefutable evidence that God exists. And then verse number 21, he says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What a devastating thing to know God, to know He exists, and then to reject it. What a war that must bring upon your soul. You see, you can't explain man's sense of right and wrong, good or evil, without concluding that there must have been a being greater than us who decided what right and wrong was and then imprinted that upon all of mankind. You see, it'd be one thing 
If it just happened to be the leader of the nation or the person who decided to write the book that all human beings lived off of. Because the fact is, we find gods, quote unquote, all around the world, around all time, because mankind has always known that there is something beyond the natural, that there is something that is greater than they are. Mankind has always known that there is something that controls the universe and the stars and the sun and the moon, and so they have gone to worship the sun, and they've worshipped the moon, they've worshipped the stars, they've gone so far as to worship the ocean, and to worship the trees, and to worship the squirrels, which climbed up under my truck today. I thought, he's going to get up here and he's going to bite through my brake lines. He was making me mad. I couldn't get him out of there though. But you know, they would worship the squirrels and the snakes and the scorpions and everything under the sun. They would worship instead of the creator. They would worship the creature. But you cannot explain man's sense of right and wrong without there being a centralized God across all time and all people. How is it that in every society around the world, people have a natural sense within them of right and wrong? Every society around the world, you go to an island, and there's not a whole lot of places left anymore that, does, that don't have contact with the outside world, but even on those places, you come to find out, hey, they punish wrongdoers. If you steal, they punish you. If you hurt other people or children or take somebody else's wife, they punish you. If you kill somebody, they'll punish you, maybe probably even kill you, you know, in return. There's always been the sense of, throughout every culture, across every time, things that are not acceptable to do. This is whatever word they may use, evil, wicked, bad, whatever language, this is wrong and this is right. Every society. Even societies or people that have no biblical law still have a moral system. Look at Romans 2, verse 14. Romans chapter number 2, verse 14, here talking about the Gentiles, because what about them? They did not receive the law of Moses. How should they be held accountable for the law? Romans 2, 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. In other words, the Gentiles, they were not given the Ten Commandments. They were not given the prophets of God. They were not given the direct physical leadership of God in the pillar of fire or smoke. They were not given the direct presence of God. They were not given the words of God. But when the Gentiles, who did not receive the law of God, still behave in a manner consistent with the law of God, that reveals that it was already inside them. When they do by nature, when they naturally do the things that are in the law, these, the Gentiles, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. See, a child knows lying is wrong the very first time they try it. A child knows that hitting another kid in the nursery is wrong. They know that. They know to hide it. They know not to let, you know, they know to look around before they do something that's wrong. It's innate. It's natural. It's written upon their hearts, it says in verse 15. Their conscience also beareth witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. What does that mean? In the midst of all these doings, in their thoughts, they're accusing or excusing. In other words, they're judging one another. What you're doing is right or what you're doing is wrong. What does that mean? That it means it wasn't just right or wrong for me. It's not subjective. When I look what you're doing, I can say that is right or wrong, which means that it must be universally right or wrong, not just subjectively right or wrong for myself. This is what the Scripture has to say about it. Having not the law or a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts. The problem for atheists is this. If they admit the existence of evil, 
they must also admit the existence of good. There cannot be one without the other. I remember having an argument with, with somebody one time about, you know, the, the difference between believing in heaven but not believing in hell. Well, again, why would you choose to believe in reward if you don't believe in punishment? Or the difference between believing in uh, being rewarded for your righteousness when, as a Christian, we stand before, you know, stand in heaven, versus having the blood of the lost in our hands when we had the opportunity to witness to them and chose not to. Why would we uh, be... Why would we be, you know, not be punished for you know, not doing the right things when we would be rewarded? Why would one come and not the other? The problem is, if they admit the existence of evil, they must admit the existence of good. But who can objectively say what is good? Who gets to say what good is? If we leave that up to the modern media, if we leave that up to society or the universities or the intellectuals or the philosophers then it will ever be changing and it will never be settled. If I leave what is good up to you, then you're going to proclaim the things that you want and desire as good. That's what I would do if it was up to me. Then I would just decide that the things that I like and the things that make me happy are good. And the things that I don't like, no matter what they are, no matter how pleasant they may seem to you, chewing on ice, bad, wicked, death penalty right there, you know. <laughs> Among other things, you know, get, let it, I'm starting to sound like my brother I used to drive him nuts when people would let their spoon or their fork touch their teeth while they're eating or chewing with their mouth open. You know, some of my kids are getting real bad about that these days. Um, death penalty right then and there, you know, you know, making, making noise, too much noise while you're eating. <laughs> we don't eat like cows around here. Now, that's silly because it doesn't matter what I think. That's the point here. You know, we don't have a justice system that operates that way. Our justice system, does, justice system does not operate based upon what I think is right or wrong, but it operates based upon the black and white letter of the law. The law says this is illegal. Now, there are certainly times where uh, that is ignored. Take the southern border, for example. Uh, there are times where the letter of the law is completely ignored, and in many other cases where that is the case. And then there's times where you know, the hammer come down heavy, comes down heavy on areas where the law is not completely clear. That's, that's the nature of humanity. You know, we're going to make mistakes in those areas. But how can one say that something is objectively good or evil? Only the reality of God can explain that. There was an atheist, I was listening to him arguing with a Christian apologet, ap apologist, and he argued that good and evil would not exist if mankind did not exist. They said, well, do you believe that good and evil exist? Well, how about this? What if every last person, every man on the earth, you know, died, ceased to exist? Because according to evolution, that's what's going to happen. You know, uh, Homo sapien, us, are going to cease to exist. And then, I don't know, the reptiles are going to become, you know, intelligent or something. Or, or the whales or who knows what. You know, it's going to become intelligent next. And, you know, after the humans have all left off of the scene. Will right and wrong, will good and evil still exist even if there are no humans here? to know it or to do those things. Well, it reminds me of this question. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, did it make a noise? And a lot of really intelligent people can sit there and argue about whether or not it would make a noise. So a tree falls in the forest, no one's there to hear it, did it make a sound? Well, the answer to that question is yes. Why? Because the production of sound does not rely upon sound receptors to create sound. In other words, that tree is not relying upon my ears to create that sound. What is it relying upon? It is relying upon the laws of physics to create sound. And the laws of physics do not bend and cannot be broken by anybody except God. And so when a tree falls in the forest, we know that that sound of the cracking is going to cause waves in the air, which are going to travel and bounce off things. And as it crashes down through other limbs and things break, it's going to make cracking and crashing sounds. And then when it hits, it's going to cause a loud thump and it's going to vibrate the ground and it's going to cause great amounts of noise. Whether or not my ears are there, it does not change the laws of physics. Why? Because the sound production is based upon something outside of me. 
So, we go back to the previous question, will good and evil cease to exist if mankind's not around? Well, yeah, because good and evil have nothing to do with mankind. It has everything to do with something greater than us, something concrete, something that is outside of us. It is based upon God, His Word. God is good. God is right. That is concrete. That cannot bend. That cannot break. So it has nothing to do with me. In fact, this problem for some atheists is so severe that some actually do deny the reality of evil. It's kind of a catch-22 for them. If there is an evil, if they, willing, if they have to admit that, then there has to be a good. And then they have to ask the question, answer the question, who decides what that is? So, some go so far as to say there is no evil. Richard Dawkins, there's a name that you might have recognized. He calls belief in God a delusion. He also denies the existence of evil. So, if I were to strangle a baby, that is not objectively evil, as far as he and many other philosophers, scientists, whatever you want to call them, are concerned. He wrote this, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. The universe we see indicates to us no design. Really? <laughs> no design? I would automatically know somebody, some engineer in some office somewhere designed this thing. Somebody had to have created it. Somebody thought it up. Somebody designed each and every individual part which was put into this. No design. No purpose. No good. No evil. Nothing but pitiless indifference. Okay. Okay. If you just looked at the animal world, then it might seem like there is no justice and that there is no good and that there is no evil well, you would have to see there's design, maybe no purpose. But when you include humanity into that, you cannot tell me there's no design. You cannot tell me that there is no good or evil and that there is only pitiless indifference. You cannot look at humanity. Now, there are certainly humans out there that are pitiless and indifferent and evil and purposeless. But you cannot look at humanity as a whole and say that those things exist. Every rejection of God and every rejection of truth necessarily leads to another one, culminating in an empty, lonely, meaningless life, which many end up cutting short on their own because they have been sold the lie from the K-5 years of schooling, they have been sold the lie that there is no God, there is no meaning, there is no purpose apart from gratifying myself. And once I've gratified myself about as much as, as I can, what is there left? If my pain outweighs my blessing, then I might as well just go ahead and enter into nothingness. This is what the world around us teaches us. Let's talk about purpose for a second, moral purpose. Within this intellect that is given to us by God is also a purpose, a reason for living. Do you have a reason for living? Technically, yes, we all do. Technically, yes, God has given each of us a, or has a, a purpose or a will for every single one of us. Now, that does not mean that we're going to fulfill that will. You may have rats in your barn, and so you go out and you buy a cat. But maybe you bought a cat that has been living in a house and getting fat and eating kibble, or whatever they call it when cats eat it, for far too long and has no interest in catching mice or rats for you. You might have intended a purpose for that cat, and that cat had no desire to fulfill the purpose you intended for it, but it stands at, the, at your door window looking in and meowing and sneaking in every time you open the door because that's where it would prefer to be. God has a purpose for us, absolutely. 
Romans 1 describes how when men stop glorifying and thanking God, this eventually leads to a life without purpose. Look again at verse number 22, Romans 1, 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. At the time when the scripture was written, the Greeks worshipped you know, very, very, very many gods. And many of the gods that they worshipped resembled animals. They worshipped eagles. They worshipped other birds. Many other cultures like the Egyptians, uh, the Canaanites, many others worshipped things that were fashioned after man. The Philistines, you know, worshipped a god that was half fish and half man. Uh, you know, other cultures would do very similar things. They would worship gods that looked like bulls, uh, but stood on human legs or the other way around, or however their imagination, you know, uh, ran off with them, they would fashion a god after that thing. So there were certainly evidences of the Greeks' rejection of the true God, and they turned objects into gods and claimed wisdom, but God declares them to be fools. Because God has given us the intellectual ability to understand that there is a greater purpose than life, than just pleasing ourself. There's a greater purpose in your life than having the next video game and the next toy. There is a greater purpose in your life than getting through the next school year. There is a greater purpose in your life than building muscles or trimming down. There is a greater purpose in your life than comfortable couches and chairs and televisions. There is a greater purpose in your life than where we get to go on vacation next. There is a greater purpose in your life than where you're going to spend four years, eight years, ten years in college and postgraduate studies. There's a greater purpose in life even than your career, whether it be doctor, lawyer, um, or uh, you know, pilot, or military, or mom. There's a greater purpose in your life than even your career. That's not to say that we can't have things, and that's not to say that we can't have careers or go to college or, you know, finish school or have toys or play video games. That's not to say that we can't have those things, but that cannot be our driving factor. What gets us up in the morning, even when we're sick, what gets us walking out the door, even when we have a headache, what keeps us going, even greater than money, there has to be a purpose. A God-given purpose. If all we're doing is living for ourselves, then yes, we are fools. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 say, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes. That's written by Song of Solomon, or that's written by Solomon, right? The wisest man to have ever lived? Yeah. Not only was he the wisest man to have ever lived, man, he was a very, 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 very rich man. Had anything he could possibly wanted. Solomon, he built spectacular buildings. He had spectacular gardens. Man, he had the Ferrari racing camels. He had gold, he had silver, he had swimming pools, he had tons of women. He had everything that there was to offer in life. And what does that man say the whole duty of man is? Was it running the nation of Israel and being king? He was that. But that wasn't the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man was to fear God and keep His commandments. You know what's nice or interesting about those two commands? It applies to the President of the United States, and it applies to the homeless person in the gutter. It applies to the middle class, to the upper class, to the lower class. It applies no matter what skin color you may have or language you may speak. It applies to all people of all times. Fear God and keep His commandments. Whether He has given you a high IQ or a minimal IQ, fear God and keep His commandments. But I'm not smart enough to do anything for God.
fear God and keep His commandments. But I'm not wise enough or rich enough or popular enough to go out and have a big following on social media or to become a politician. Fear God and keep His commandments. If you're a trash person or if you're a Virginia delegate, fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And so we back up here. The understanding that God has placed His knowledge in our heart should give us the courage to speak up for Him. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because there's some people that we look at them and we think, well, that's a hard case right there. <laughs> uh, maybe there's a bunch of tattoos and they just appear like they're mean or angry and that's just kind of like a front, you know, or a shell that they put on. Maybe they're Hindu or Muslim or Jewish or Catholic and you, you think, wow, there's, there's, there are, they've already got these strongly held beliefs. I'm not going to be able to penetrate through all of that. Well, you're always going to be right on that case because it's not your job to penetrate through it anyways. It's your job to simply present the gospel. Understand this. You've got an inside guy. You've got somebody on the inside because they already have a natural witness inside of themselves, innate truth and moral truth inside of them that is witnessing right along with you. It's like a little speaker inside their heart that is copying everything you're saying and saying, yeah, uh-huh, what he said, mm -hmm, yeah, what he said. Listen to him, listen to him. Because they already have that truth inside them that there is a God. They have to fight it. They have to quiet it. And they may get angry to quiet it and to silence it. But that should give you courage. That should give you courage to stand up and speak up for Christ. Because no matter how hard they may fight it, You've got an inside man. Inside their heart, they already know the truth. Every, art, every heart already has a curiosity about God. Every heart already has a God-sized hole that can only be filled by Jehovah, God the Father, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, His Son. Are there anybody, is there anybody that you feel particularly intimidated to share the gospel with? I know for me, if I'm trying to talk to somebody and if they say that they're like a Hindu or if they're a Muslim, I automatically get intimidated. Not because I'm afraid they're going to be a terrorist or something, but they've got some strongly held beliefs that I don't know very much about. If they tell me, oh, I'm a Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, okay, I have at least a, a baseline understanding, you know, of where they're coming from, but when it comes to some of those others, it's like, man, I, I, don't, even, I don't even know where to start with you. <laughs> you know, we, we don't share scriptures that we can both, you know, a same foundation that we can kind of go to. But understand this, it's not my job to penetrate their defenses anyways. And so the same gospel that I would share with a Mormon or a Roman Catholic is the exact same gospel that I should share with a Buddhist. I don't need to change a thing about it. If somebody, you know, says, oh, I'm, I'm a Jew. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm good. I don't need that. I'm a Jewish. You know, they need to hear the exact same gospel as anybody else. They may be closed to it because of their religiosity, but the gospel has not changed. No matter whether we're talking Old Testament, New Testament, you know, church age, now, whether we're talking about the great tribulation, you know, the, the, the gospel itself of Jesus Christ hasn't changed. The only thing that's really changed is who's living currently upon this earth at any given time. So having this understanding that we all have that internal witness inside of us should be a benefit to us and a help to us. Maybe as you talk to people, recognize maybe they have an internal battle going on. Maybe that's why they look so sour, <laughs> because they're, they're constantly fighting the spiritual battle on the inside and they're losing it. And so they have to keep that hard shell and exterior. But you can still be sweet and kind and 
lovingly share the gospel with them. Next Wednesday evening, we're going to come back, Lord willing, and look at external revelation. We just looked at internal revelation. We'll come back and look at external revelation. So God has revealed His existence to us in our hearts. But God has also revealed His existence to us in things that we can see and hear and feel and study and experiment on. And so next Wednesday evening, Lord willing, we're going to come back and cover this section of the external revelation of God.